Oh, I'm a little, I'm a little bit concerned with how much you enjoyed that clip. It's, it's somewhat disturbing. Oh, it's good being back with you, man. It's great to take a vacation, but good to come home. And uh, this is going to be fun because we do launch a new series. I can't even say the title. It's a big, long title. Basically, it's RV, Fun Explosions. It's about a road trip, and we're going to take a journey with Jesus through his three-year earthly ministry. He, he crammed so much, so many miracles and, and teachings and all uh, into a three-year public ministry, age 30 to age 33, and I want to spend like the next six weeks taking this apart on this road trip together. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you'll be here every week unless when you're on your road trip taking your vacation. Speaking of a road trip, one component of a great road trip is a great beginning. Right? You get off to a good start, right? Because you get off to a bad start, right? You know, if you get a flat tire, if you have a car trouble, if your flight gets canceled, it's hard to recover from that. But on the other hand, if the kids... Get out of the house and in the car without drama. My brothers, if you make record time to your first destination, if you, uh, if you get upgraded to first class, hallelujah. I mean, that, that is the beginning of what can be a great road trip. So this could be the greatest journey uh, of all of life. Jesus, during these three years, it's recorded in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it gets off to a great beginning. So to understand the beginning of Jesus' ministry, you actually have to back up to the ministry of someone called John, John the Baptist. So I want to study this together. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. And you're looking good this summer. You've been working out this summer, eating clean. Let's see how you sound this summer. That text together, Matthew chapter. Come on again. All campus is louder than that. Matthew chapter. There you go. Find Matthew chapter 3, and I want to show you the ministry of John the Baptist. In fact, we'll check out a couple different places in the Bible. But Jesus said this about John. Talk about a great beginning. Jesus said something remarkable about this man we call John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, it's on the screen right now at all of our campuses. You read the highlighted word. Jesus said, I, Truly I tell you, among those born of women... There has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Jesus, with divine accuracy, says the greatest person who ever lived, John. John is the greatest. The greatest. Now, now listen, you get one shot at this thing called life. One chance. There's not a teenager in the room right now dreaming, I hope I live my one life at the level of mediocrity. I want my one life to be unspecial and mundane, right? No, no one says, I want to take this one precious life and live my life in pain and dysfunction. No. You want to take this one life that God has given you and make it great. Starting today, I want to steward this one shot, be it long or short, I have a life and make it great. And I probably can learn from John because John didn't live a really long life, but Jesus said the greatest of all time was John. So Jesus has this great ministry, but this great ministry begins with the ministry of John. John was the forerunner or the prophet who preceded the Messiah. So I want to back all the way up, get a good start on our road trip for the next six weeks, and study the ministry of this guy, John the Baptist, because Jesus said he was great. And by the way, as I think about the idea of great, typically today in our current society, when we think about somebody being great, we mean uh, they're great because of certain components present in their life, like if someone's great, maybe they have elite athletic ability that makes them great, or they have unusual musical talent, or they have a charisma, or they have, I don't know, political connections, or an abundance of academic degrees. Well, those things are all good things, wonderful things, but based on those standards, John would not be great. He had none of those things. In fact, based on those criteria, Jesus would not be great. So we may have to recalibrate great. But I do believe God wants your one life to be great. Now, John's ministry is so vital. His ministry shows up in all four Gospels. Not everything Jesus did shows up in all four Gospels. In fact, I thought about starting this, with, you know, this teaching about Jesus with the birth of Christ. But we covered that pretty sufficiently during December. So I want to start with this ministry. And not even all the Gospels covered the birth of Christ. Like Mark starts, starts with grown-up, hair on his chest, adult Jesus. 
But John's ministry is in all four of these narrative biographies. So let me show you a couple. We'll read a little more text than we typically do. Here's what it says in Matthew chapter, uh, chapter, Matthew, you're there, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40 to be precise, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Get, get the road ready because Messiah is coming. A little uh, commentary, verse 4 on couture. If you have a sense of fashion or style, you'll like this. It says, John's clothes were made of camel's hair, kind of scratchy, itchy, and he had a, a leather belt around his waist. Uh, his diet, his food was locusts. I don't even know what that makes you. That's, that's not vegan. That's not vegetarian. What is locust? Insectarian. So he ate, he ate bugs, ate locusts and wild honey to choke down the locusts. And, but verse 5, but he is, he's, he's so impactful. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptized, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Let's just stop right there. That's about as far away from a Joel Olstein sermon as you get, right? That's, I mean, how seeker-friendly is that? You brood of vipers who warns you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit, keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I, I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one more powerful than I, whose sandals... I'm not worthy to carry or unlatch. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So that's one of the four Gospels. Just for fun, let's check out another one. Go to the, the final Gospel, John's Gospel. Not written by John the Baptist, but John the Disciple. He says this about the baptizer's ministry. Verse 19, chapter 1. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the path of the Lord. Then jumping down to verse 29, the next day Jesus, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the earth. He's the goat. He is the greatest of all time, based on the appraisal of Jesus. So what made him so great? What made him so great? What, what made him so remarkable? What's going on contextually where he's popular? Because guess what? I'm thinking if we could put ourselves in the sandals of a first century Jew. He was a Jewish prophet, a Jewish congregation, Jewish audience. We might think he was provocative. We might think he was unusual. We might deem him intriguing, surely unorthodox, but might not think he's the greatest of all time. That, that might surprise us. So, so what's taking place during this time? Well, again, we're studying the first part of Jesus' ministry, the first books in something called the New Testament. The New Testament is the latter 27 books of your Bible, reflects on the life and ministry of Christ. And then before that, we have, of course, the Old Testament, the original 37 books of the Hebrew Bible. So what happens in between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, it's not like Incredibles 1 and Incredibles 2, where like it picks up like right away, like here's the rest of the story like in the next minute. There's a 400-year gap. Like, if you're like me, you got a paper Bible, you got like a few blank pages and like an introduction page and table of contents. That represents four centuries. The Jewish people have been waiting and been longing. In fact, in fact, carrying on the whole road trip theme, hey, parents, what's the number one question that comes in the back seat after you've been driving for four hours? <laughs> Are we there yet? We're driving to Nebraska. No, we're not there. Are we there yet? See, the people of God, because what's taken place during the 400 years and just before that end of the Old Testament was oppression. They've been oppressed. They've been victimized. There's these, these nasty, negative neighboring nations, these oppressive regimes and empires, first the Babylonians and, and then the Persians. And then between the two testaments during the 400 years, the Greeks. Remember Alexander the Great from Civics? Uh, conquers most of the known world, uh, dies in his early 30s, has no adult heir. So after that, four of his lieutenants, they subdivide his massive kingdom. And Israel is kind of a vassal state. 
being, being jostled between all these mighty empower, empires. And then, and then a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes. Probably never heard of him. Antiochus Epiphanes, weird name, by the way. Uh, he shows up in Daniel's prophecy about the future, and he goes to the holy place in the temple in Jerusalem, and he sacrifices a swine. And that's an abomination to the people of God, and they're so outraged, it begins a rebellion, and, and a guy who leads them, a charismatic leader named, named uh, Judas Maccabean. Judas Maccabean. That's why in the first century, Hebrew people are naming their kids Judas. There's two disciples named Judas. We don't name our kids Judas anymore, amen? Don't name your kid Judas. Uh, but he was a hero, Judas Maccabean. Maccabean loosely translates Judas the hammer. And this, this leader, he hammers the Greeks and they have a brief, shining, short season of independence. It's glorious. In fact, Hanukkah is based during this season of independence between the Old and the New Testament. You still with me? And then the Greeks are supplanted by the ruthless rule of Rome. And when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John begin, the Israelites have been dominated and oppressed by the Romans. But before the Romans, it was the Greeks. And before the Greeks, the Persians. Before the Persians, the Babylonians. And they're thinking, how much longer? Are we there yet? See, what they're looking for is Messiah. 400 plus years of longing and praying and hoping for Messiah. We, we didn't even, see, Messiah is going to be this, this king, this, this Jewish king. And, and, and guess what? Then it's our turn. He's going to be a conquering king. He's going to dispatch the Romans. And we're going to rule the world. We're going to find that the Jewish state will be the dominant state. And we won't be evil. We'll be ruthless. We'll be kind. But we'll be in charge. How much longer, God, until you finally send Messiah? And then John shows up. And everyone knows in life we say, uh, I don't mean to be offensive. And then we say something offensive. I think if you met John back in the day and John's preaching in the wilderness, you'd probably say, hey, John, I, I don't mean to be offensive, but uh, you're not exactly what we were expecting. We're kind of looking for a Messiah. Is that you? I, I mean, it might be you because there had been no prophetic voice in 400 years. God had not spoken with authority in 400 years. But here John shows up, and God's speaking through him. Are, are you the Messiah? He wasn't what they expected. But Jesus said he was great. He was great. He was the greatest of all time. He was, he was great. He was great. But guess what? You're clapping right now. But if you were there in the day, you'd think intriguing, interesting, surprising, unusual, unorthodox. I don't know about great. But I was thinking through John, I, I jotted down some notes in, in my journal. I wrote down several things that might surprise people about John. He was not what they expected. Like I wrote down like his, his message. His message was not the message they expected. Uh, they listened to his message. They came out to hear him preach, but his message was not the one. And they probably wouldn't think the message was great. In, in fact, uh, as he, you know, they thought about look towards the coming of Messiah, when they thought about Messiah, they thought Messiah is going to be what? Our Messiah. He's going to be our Messiah. He's going to be our king. He's going to set up our kingdom. This is about us. It's a Jewish Messiah, a Jewish king, and a Jewish kingdom that will rule the earth. And then, by the way, it mentions in Matthew's account that two of the political parties, spiritual political parties, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they show up. And by the way, the Sadducees and Pharisees, uh, theologically and politically, agreed on almost nothing. They argued about everything, kind of like Republicans and Democrats in America, right? They, they, they argued about everything and agreed on almost nothing except one thing in their theologies, that to be cool with God, you, you had to be a Jew. In fact, pretty much all you needed to do to be cool with God was to be a Jew. In fact, some of the rabbis of John's day taught that Father Abraham uh, wasn't positioned in heaven. He wasn't by the gates of heaven. He had a seat by the gates of hell just to make sure no Jews slip between the cracks. In fact, the rabbis thought that Abraham had to check the men to see if they were circumcised. What a horrible job to give Abraham for all of eternity, right? Oh, oh my gosh, what a terrible gig. Because all God is looking for is your heritage. If your ancestry.com shows that Abraham is anywhere in your lineage, you're cool. And then John, a Jewish preacher, a Jewish prophet speaking to a Jewish audience and guess what if you're counting on Abraham being your father punching your ticket God could God could look at these rocks and create sons of Abraham what God's looking for 
is a change of your heart. God's leaving this thing that John called repentance. It's a 180 in your heart. It's, it's so falling in love with God, being so captured by the love of God, that this change of your heart reflects in your attitudes, your actions, your affections. It's a change of direction. God is all about the heart. God doesn't care who your daddy is. It's been said, God has no grandchildren, only children. You make your own choice about God. And, and that message, <laughs> that was not what they were expecting. And they probably wouldn't say it was great, but Jesus said he was the greatest of all time. And, and then I wrote down not just the message, but the messenger. The messenger, John himself, was probably not what people were expecting. Back in verse 23, Matthew's account, they asked the question, are, are, are you the Messiah? Tell us, are you the Messiah? Here's all the buzz. Are you the Messiah? Now, just... Let's be honest, be human right here. I mean, John's the first prophetic voice in 400 years. Crowds are coming to him. And when he's asked, are you the Messiah? Remember what he said? He said, no, I am not the Messiah. Are you the one who came in the spirit of Elijah? No. Are you a prophet? No. It might be tempting if you're a preacher where they said, are you the Messiah? Just let the question hang for a little while. Just, just, you know, really, really, what are they saying about me? Hmm, am I the Messiah? Hmm. There's a little buzz about me being Messiah. Hmm. Think what that would do to your social media following, right? John, hashtag Messiah, question mark. Maybe. Am I the Messiah? I mean, I'm not saying that I am. I'm just letting people talk. Because Messiah was the man. They weren't looking for John. They were looking for Messiah. 400 years of anticipation, Messiah. The Messiah is coming. Are you the Messiah? Because the Messiah is the man. And John says, no. I'm not the man. In fact, I love his answer. He said, you know what I am? And he quotes Isaiah. It's always good to memorize scripture. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm just the voice. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, let me give you the Greek word for the word there, crying. And by the way, I don't do that a whole lot. If you're new to our church, lots of preachers like to break down the Bible into the original Greek and Hebrew. And that, that's, that's fine. But I resist that sometimes. Why? I never want to sow any seeds of distrust in the Bible in your language. Hear me on this. You can trust the Bible in your language. Brilliant scholars have given their, their, their work and their intelligence to translating the Bible. So if you're reading your Bible right now in Creole, you can trust the Bible in Creole. If you're reading your Bible in Portuguese, you can trust your Bible in Portuguese. If you're reading your Bible in Mandarin, you can trust your Bible in Mandarin. You with me? If you're reading your Bible in Spanish or in English, you can trust the Bible just the way it is. You don't need a degree in Greek to understand the Word of God. It won't change things. Sometimes it gives you just a little nuance, a little small detail you might miss. And so the Greek word here for cry is the word caruso. It means a herald. A herald. Well, what's, what's a herald? Okay, remember watching some movie back in the day with like the knights and castles and the king. And before the king rides up with his entourage on a stallion, this dude in tights with a horn goes out and toots the horn and says, The king is coming. That's the herald. The king is on. Make ready for the. That is the herald. The herald's just a guy who tells you the king is coming. I love John's attitude. Am I a Messiah? No. Am I Elijah? No. Who are you? I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy who's telling you the king is coming. The Messiah is coming. Get the road ready for his road trip. Get your heart ready. The king is coming. That's, that's my job. See, I think it's so vital because a lot of us fall into the trap of comparing ourselves with other people. In fact, I love social media, but as you watch people's social media, their vacations right now, you know none of that stuff's true, right? <laughs> I just spent six days with my family. We didn't show you all the drama getting the kids ready and getting packed and unpacked and the hotel room that wasn't ready. We, we didn't show you all the bad attitudes. We, 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 we find that one shining moment. We take the picture, right? You put a filter on the picture, and that, that, that reflects the awesome time. No, that's not true. But we see that, and we compare ourselves, and we measure ourselves, and we feel inadequate. And I love John going, I'm... I'm I'm not the man. He's the man. In fact, the whole line he throws in about, you know, I'm not even qualified to untie his Jordans line. What, what's, that, what's that all about? You know, to unlash his sandals. That was the job you would give to not just any servant, but the, 
least respected servant, the servant with the least prestige. If you were a Jewish master with Jewish slaves and you had one Gentile, he, the Gentile guy got the job. He's like, I'm, I got the Gentile shoe job. I don't even care. I'm just a voice. But what I love about that, I love about that is I'm not the Messiah. No, I'm not the Messiah. No, I'm, I'm not Elijah. No. Sometimes before you discover who you are, you have to discover who you're not. Sometimes you have to just be honest and praise your life. There's certain things I'm not. In fact, even to grow, growth begins with acknowledging certain things that you're not. I, I, I'm not good under pressure, right? Before you can grow and fix that, you've got to acknowledge you have an issue. I'm not good with money. Let me just stop right now. There are hundreds of people in this room right now. You are terrible with money, but you won't acknowledge that. Your credit card statement bears out the fact that I'm telling you the truth. I'm not good with money, so I need to fix that. I need to go to Financial Peace University and begin to heal and get smart and grow in that area. There's a single person here like, I'm not good at picking a man. I can't pick a man. I keep picking one user and loser. I, I got Guess what? You need to invite some smart people who love you and love God and have discernment into your relationship choices because you're stupid with relationships, right? I'm not the man. You can acknowledge a negative without becoming a negative person as part of growth. I'm just a voice. But I love about John, I love about John. And Jesus is his cousin. Do you have a highly accomplished family member? I mean, he's his cousin. But there's no jealousy, there's no pushback. There's no sense of entitlement. Listen, a lot of us would like to be famous. Why? Because of the perks. Through the limos, the red carpet, the entourage, the freebies. I'd be entitled. John's like, I, shoe guy. I'm shoe guy. Dirty feet guy, that's my job. I'm just a voice. But I love this. He's not just content with his calling. He's passionate for his calling. I'm just a voice, but I'm the best voice you will ever hear. I'm the most passionate voice. I'm a courageous voice. I'm an empowered voice. I am... This is God's calling on my life. I am a faithful voice. I love the message. I love the messenger. Though in the day they thought, this is not what we're expecting. This does not feel great at all. Then finally his method, his method, what's he do? He preaches repentance and then he dunks people. He dunks people. John the Baptist, the word Baptist there is the Greek word baptizo. It means to immerse. So he literally translated his name is John the dunking dude. That's what it means. And so as a physical sign of that inward change, he's immersing people. By the way, we baptize people at church by the glades. We do not baptize people because John baptized people. We baptize people because Jesus commanded baptism. I show you a passage pretty often with some regularity. It's the final two verses in Matthew's account. And here's what Jesus says. This, the chronology of this is vital. This is after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, after 40 days of showing himself to be very much alive, right before he ascends to the Father. He says, do this until I get back. It's on the screen right now. I've highlighted one word. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Now look at verse 20. Verse 20, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Teach them all the stuff. Because everything I said was awesome. <laughs> teach, teach them, you know, I taught you about prayer. I taught you about forgiveness. I taught you about how to manage your stress, how to manage your money, how to manage your marriage. I taught you about heaven and hell. Teach them all. Teach them there's dozens. And teach them all of it. It's all great. But he gets out his highlighter. He, he underscores one thing. Baptism. Baptism. So obviously, baptism is really important to Jesus. So if you've not been baptized, he commanded it. Something else to think about, too. One of the reasons they record John's ministry is the ministry of Jesus begins with Jesus being baptized by John. Whoa. Jesus was baptized. In fact, if you read it, it's kind of a fun conversation because John feels unworthy. When Jesus shows up, John knows he's Messiah. He's like, I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm like shoe guy, right? I can't baptize you. In fact, it's kind of a funny dialogue that he says, I should be baptized by you. And Jesus says, no, I need to be baptized. And they go back, no, you baptize me, I'll baptize you. No, you baptize me, go back and forth. And finally, Jesus said, hey, it's my Father's will. And John says, I'm down. <laughs> God will call you to do things you do not feel qualified or worthy to do. Just obey the call of God. And so... Jesus is baptized. So listen, all I need is a command from Christ and I have a clear command from Christ. But this is one of the times I get to follow Jesus' example because any times I can be like Jesus or emulate Jesus, I want to, but most of the things Jesus did, I can't do. I doubt I'll ever open blind eyes or raise the dead or I'll probably never walk on water, but we can all be dunked in the water. 
Because Jesus did that and Jesus commands that. So if you have not been baptized, that's the outward sign of that heart change. You should be baptized because Christ commanded it. And I think you should be baptized today. We have it every campus means to baptize you today, except for Dade County. Dade County campuses, we have to make arrangement with the authorities and we'll baptize you in the very near future. But right here we got, we got like a, over in the corner of the room, we have a sanctified jacuzzi thing over there and we'll baptize you today. And I know you don't want to get your clothes wet, but we got clothes. Get our clothes wet and you can dry off and but be baptized because Jesus commanded baptism. And if you want to do it today, next best thing is the beach baptism coming up on the 5th. And so you go to the lobby, that's the worst applause ever. That's, thank you. I'll give you a second shot. And you can be baptized on the 5th. And I, listen, I think that's better because that's climate controlled over there. But if you want the waves and stuff because it's Florida, it's drama, do it. But no, if you register, the devil is going to try to mess with that decision between now and the 5th. Just don't let him win. Now, I'll, I'll tell you this. We baptize. You guys see the pictures of the baptisms that has been behind me already? Show we baptize all kinds of people, and, and what you see are the faces are always these amazing pics of faces, and, and almost everyone who's baptized will tell you one of the greatest days in their life and greatest things they've ever done is, is, is baptism. And God wants your life to be great. So um, follow Jesus' example and obey his command. So John's doing this unorthodox, weird, surprising thing. They didn't baptize Jews. They would baptize Gentiles who were converting to Judaism. They didn't baptize. But here John, a Jewish preacher and Jewish prophet, is baptizing Jews as an outward sign of that inward heart change. And Jesus called him the greatest. John's the goat. You know what bugs me? Does your Bible ever annoy you? If you're afraid to answer that. Mine does. Mine does, because I want more information. I want more, I, I got some details. I, I, I want like, so I wish, you know, in John eleven eleven, Jesus said the greatest of all time is John. That's a huge statement. I wish in John eleven twelve, 12, he told you why. Because think of the people who are also in the Bible who are at best second greatest, right? Abraham, Abraham, the father of faith. John's greater. Moses, deliverer, lawgiver. Oh my gosh, iconic leader. John's greater. Uh, David, the benchmark for biblical kings. It takes out a giant once in a while. John is greater. Elijah performs a plethora of meaningful miracles. John is greater. Solomon, an abundance of brains. John is greater. Samson, the biblical bodybuilder, strong. John's greater. I can keep on going. The greatest is John. Why? Jesus never says. But maybe, maybe it's, it's just my theory. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, we get to heaven. I'll apologize to you. But if you look at John chapter 1, verse 29, it's on the screen right now at every campus. I like what happens, you know, after the whole question one day, who are you? Are you Messiah? No. Are you Elijah? No. Who are you? I'm, I'm just the voice of ones and get ready because the king is coming. Well, the next day, the king shows up. And I love this powerful verse. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold. That was pretty good, but you got to read that loudly because no one says behold, like, behold. Oh, behold, right now. Behold, was like, behold! Let's try to get rid of it. Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold! That was great. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I thought, wow. There's a lot of pressure on John. Why? Because he's the first prophet in 400 years, and people have 400 years of backloaded God questions. You know, God, why the Babylonians? And why? the Persians and why the Assyrians and why the Greeks and why the Romans now and why the pain and why the, I thought we're your chosen people. I thought we're your favorites. I thought why, why, why? John's here. John's going to tell us all that stuff and John's thinking, I, I don't know all those reasons why. But there's one thing I know. I'm not Messiah. He's coming behind me. I'm just getting the road ready. I'm getting your hearts ready. He's come, king is coming. I'm not the king. And then the day the king shows up, he points with all he has, with all of his energy and through. Behold, that's the Lamb of God. My time is done. It's his time. It's Jesus' time right now. He Maybe he was great because the clarity of his one purpose was to point people to Jesus. He, he wasn't great because of the unique circumstances of his birth or the fact he's filled the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb or, or the fact his ministry was so impactful. No, what, what made him so great was he just pointed people to Jesus. And so Jesus was the one 
all-consuming thing. Not the only thing, but no doubt the one most important thing in his life. So I, I would ask you this to break it down into your life. So what's, what's your one thing? What's the one, if people look at you, what's the whole thing in your life? What's that one thing that you're so passionate for, you're consumed with, right? What's that one thing that people think about you would it be, behold, golf. <laughs> Just being honest, be, be, behold, my business. Behold, my popularity. Behold, my boyfriend. Behold, my stuff or my car. Behold, my ego. Behold, if you're serving, and it, those aren't bad things. They're just not the greatest things. The greatest thing is this great God who gave his son for you. So point towards Jesus. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you're like, David, that's crazy. Why would I point towards you? Because he is worth it. Because he is that good. Because what you'll discover in him is so transformative. It's, it's, I don't have language sufficient to articulate the power of a personal relationship with this great God who died for you. We're just beginning this road trip. It's going to be fun. Don't you mess a week. But if you're here and need to give your heart to Christ, let's do it. If you're here and want to be baptized today, there'll be prayer partners at the edge of the stage. You come find one and say, I want to be baptized today. They'll hook you up today. If you want to do the beach, you go to the lobby. Make no excuses right now. If you're thinking about some reason not to, that's the devil whispering in your ear and trying to make you miss a moment that will be great in your life. Obey God. Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the power of John's ministry. He wasn't the norm. He wasn't what people expected, but he was great. We get one shot at life. Make our lives great. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.